YouTube, what is up? We are back with another weekly Q&A. We're gonna do weekly Q&A from the desk today. Um, I wanna focus on the lifting today. I just wanna get after the snatches and we'll, we'll record that separately. I think the last video got a little long with all the lifting and the Q&As and I felt like I didn't get to as many Q&As as I would have liked. So I'm gonna try and get to all the Q&As in one sitting and it'll be a total yap fest. Um, not saying we'll disregard, maybe maybe next week we go back to lifting and Q&As at the same time. But we're gonna try that this format this week and we're gonna raw dog these Q&As. So we're gonna pull it up, we're gonna rip through the Q&As and just go from there. So if you have a question for next week's Q&A, you can leave it in the YouTube comments down below or just ask on the weekly Instagram Q&As. That's where I'm pulling all these up from. But let's start. So we got Lenning510 asking most overlooked and most overrated aspects of training. I think the most overlooked aspects of training, and I, we, we talk about this on the, the YouTube quite a lot is some of the gymnastics body weight pieces of uh, training. I think there's a lot of low low hanging fruit there to be grabbed. I think there's a lot of stuff with the fingers and the hands and the wrist and the shoulders that really isn't touched on when we're just doing barbell and grabbing kind of perfectly made barbells, perfectly made dumbbells, perfectly calibrated um, weights. And uh, I've had a lot of strong men on the podcast. I've had Rafe Kelly, he really got into this and was talking about looking at your hands and where your blisters are at and seeing if you have a fully developed hand. But I really believe there's so many good qualities to just implementing basic gymnastic type movements into your program. And again, it's not because the gymnastics are special. It's not because the gymnastics are crazy. I have a bias towards believing there is a lot of benefit there and like that they, they, there is high quality, but I'm not, I don't even want to make them into a special exercise. I just think there's a lot of low hanging fruit there because not a lot of athletes do them. There's like deep range of motion pushup stuff, like athletes that just can bench low, like bench a shitload of weight and you get them into a deep range of motion push-ups, so you put their hands on kettlebells, the most basic of all gymnastic type movements, body weight type movements, and they struggle in these positions. They struggle when they have to move their own body, they have to struggle when the, the, the range of motion is just a little bit deeper than they're used to. And I think there's a lot of benefit there that not a lot of athletes are touching on. And again, you get that, that, that hand, you get the pressure of your body weight on the hands, and you're building up some hands and wrists that are a little bit thicker than uh, than the typical like barbell strong type athlete. Um, and again, it's not that the barbell is bad, it's just that I think we overemphasize the barbell aspect and miss out on a lot of the smaller pieces. Um, so I would say that's probably the most overlooked aspect in training. Most overrated aspect of training is when exercises do start to become special, right? So uh, we get to some special exercises like some of the shin raises, like uh, the tib raises, like it, it's overrated, right? It's, a, it's an uh, overrated exercise. Not that the exercise is bad, it's that we're saying a singular small muscle can solve all of our issues. Like whenever an exercise gets to that point, it's overrated. I think uh, sometimes ISOs get to that point, not because ISOs are bad, we do ISOs every single day, it's because people think they are magic, right? And then, and then they, they over-specialize in the magic and there stops being juice left to be squeezed there. So I think whenever an exercise becomes magic, whenever an exercise becomes a one size fits all fix, many times that's where it becomes overrated, right? And I think a lot of times the overlooked stuff, the stuff that we're not doing ever can be the magic that we're looking at. Um, even if it is as basic as doing some push-ups or some handstands or just basic movements you would see in a typical PE type class that we're not doing anymore. So that was pretty good. First question done in two minutes. We might get to all these. How to fix back tightness and traps, Lenning510 asks again. I think a lot of times the tightness comes from the body's inability to handle what you are putting it through, right? So. Um, if that's just sitting all day, your body's unable to handle sitting all day, maybe we just need to add more movement in. Maybe we need to strengthen some of the, the upper back and traps type. So when I had, um, I had whiplash from softball, I realized that I had taken out a lot of trap work in my program. I wasn't doing a lot of heavy pulls from the ground. I stopped Olympic lifting. And I just wasn't doing shrugs in my program. Um, and again, that's where it wasn't Olympic lifts were special. It wasn't that uh, I needed to do a bunch of shrugs and traps were super special. It was just as I wasn't touching on it. And uh, the neck had atrophied a little bit from the rest of my body. So I had a spine that I was working on every day. I had a lower body I was working on every day. I had forearms, triceps that I was working on every day. And I was able to put a ton of force to the body and the weak link of the body was my neck and it was getting beat up, right? So I think a lot of times that can be your, your measure when it comes to some of these exercises is 
where's the weak link, where are you struggling, and then working those things. And again, that can be your magic. So if you want to fix a tight back, you can check out the YouTube video I did on lower back tightness. Um, but the, the traps specifically, if you have tight traps, I think a lot of times just strengthening the traps, starting to add in some shrugs to your program, starting to add some pulling movements to your program, and then a specifically net, neck work to your program if the traps are tight. Um, one that I like doing is a four-way neck ISO. So I'll lean against the wall, and you can do manual resistance here as well, where we'll do manual resistance against the wall here, uh, four-way. So I'll lean back, lean side, lean forward. We'll hit each one for like a minute, two minutes, build that position up. And it can be really a money maker for making that neck trap region feel a lot better. And I think the same can be said for lower back stuff and, and that QL oblique type region as well. When it is weak, your body's trying to tell you it's weak and you're demanding too much of it and it feels beat up all the time. So strengthen that part, move that part, and a lot of times it'll feel a lot better. All right, FT Drabi asks, thoughts on Joel Seedman? <laughs> I think this goes back to the, are you an expert coach or are you an expert marketer? And probably into the category of tricking yourself into thinking you're one and not the other. Um, and I don't, I don't even know if Seedman can get to a point in which you can trick yourself into actually believing what you're saying. But again, I, I don't know. With some of these people, I, I think, sometimes I think these people are full of shit and then I talk to them and I'm like, oh my God, they actually believe their poop doesn't smell. Um, Seedman is a master marketer. Um, he is amazing at getting his product out there. He's amazing at doing something different. And um, I think in any debate where he's been brought up and challenged on some of these thought processes, it's pretty apparent that there's not a lot below the surface. Um, many times I'll bring people on the podcast and not, not necessarily to pick their stuff apart, but and a lot of times I don't even do it to with a, a bad intent. It, most of the times literally, oh, there's something that they're talking about that's slightly interesting. Let's dig deeper to see if it's actually something interesting, if there's actually something there, or if once you get past their, their 10 second Instagram clips, uh, if it completely falls apart. And Seedman, when you, when you look at him in long form content, you realize that it quickly, quickly falls apart. All, all of the stuff that he's talking about, it doesn't really add up. Um, and if you watch him sprint, it really tells you kind of everything. I think sprinting is a beautiful metric to see if your program works. If you watch somebody sprints and you're like, okay, that, that person, for athletics, I should say, but you watch that person sprint, you're like, okay, what he's saying, he looks stiff as fuck. So whatever the movement stuff is, the functional patterns, guys, you watch them sprint. It's just, it's just not pretty. Um, and they probably should tell you a lot about the program. So Seedman is a master marketer. You want to learn how to sell products. You want to learn how to make a lot of money. You learn from Seedman. And here's the thing. Don't throw out what he's doing just because you're pissed at all of his coaching philosophies. That's what so many coaches do. They don't realize that he does have an expertise, that he is really fucking smart. Uh, he knows what he's doing when he's getting his product out there. He knows how to do short form content and he crushes it and he has made way more money than 99.99% of coaches and he has got his brand out there and people are asking thoughts on Joel Seatman. They're not asking thoughts on some random coach that is doing a great job but not making a lot of money, right? They're asking about Joel Seatman. Whenever they're asking about people, they are good at something. So look at his stuff. What is he doing well? He's marketing amazing. He does a really nice job of getting his message out there and we should go copy that. We should go learn from that while throwing out the trash of the 9090 eccentrics. There's not a lot there. I've actually ran his program. All of these coaches too. If I will um, attack their programs, usually it's because I've ran their programs and I've done it. Not because I thought there was something good there, just because I want, again, I want to see if there's something below the surface and you run the program and it's, it, it's, eh. It's like, what are we doing here? Why, why are we 90 90 everything? Why do we have a kettlebell at 90 degrees when we're doing a squat? It's a lot of weird stuff. Um, and for an untrained athlete, maybe you get a lot out of it, but there's no magic specialty to hitting 90 90 positions. It's crazy. Um, and I think we all kind of know it's crazy, but again, his expertise is in marketing, not in coaching. His expertise is getting his message out there. His expertise is in being an entrepreneur. And I really don't fault that aspect of it. I just fault the aspect of if you're going to say one thing, you got to follow it up with another thing, right? So if you're going to say, I want to create better athletes, follow it up with a program that actually creates better athletes. Don't follow it up with trash, right? If you say, I just want to make a lot of money and get my program out there, go and do that, man. I know a lot of bros that do that. Um, ideally, you follow it up with a good program. Ideally, you follow it up with something that isn't totally trash. But I do believe there is a beautiful blend of taking somebody who's like Seedman's marketing and applying it to a good program. And you can have a beautiful blend of a great program with great marketing and make a lot of money while getting good results and having a clean conscience. So thoughts on Joel Seedman right there. Let's go to the next one. 
be Austin for as key concepts to focus on as a coach slash personal trainer. What do you deem invaluable? Key concepts to focus on as a coach slash personal trainer. Are your athletes getting results? Are your clients getting results? Do they come back? Do you have clients? Do you have, uh, do you have results? Do you have data points? Uh, I was talking with Jake Turo a while back on a podcast and it was, it was just, he laid it out very clearly for me in one of the best ways that we were talking about, but it's like, if you feel insecure about your program, if you feel like you need to get key concepts, if you need to, you don't know what you need to focus on, it's because you don't have enough data points. You don't have enough confidence in your program currently because there's not enough to back yourself up, right? So don't try to fake confidence. Don't try to focus on things that'll make you a better coach. Like actually be a better coach and get results and these things will kind of come together. Uh, And what to focus on to get there, right? You can't really think about that, right? It's, it's like, what's the individual athlete in front of you need? What do they need to get results? How do you do that? You actually become interested in not the program. You don't become interested in the methods or the exercises. Become very interested in how do I get this athlete from point A to point B? And if all you have right now is one athlete or one client, focus on that super intently and you'll figure out how to get results with that one athlete and one client. And you know what that's going to lead to? They're going to tell two people. Then you're going to have three clients, right? Okay, now all three of them are different. You need to focus on how do you get results with three clients. And you really over gradually over time, you're going to prove to yourself that you can get results with a lot of different clients. But that is what you need to focus on. That is the key concepts you need to focus on as a personal trainer and as a coach. EC Power, Evie, the GOAT, asks, how do you work with athletes who mentally are scared to do things, have the yips? Oh, we already answered this question two episodes ago. I made a whole kind of uh, YouTube series on this one because I thought that was a good question. There's an 11-minute rant on that YouTube video. Check that one out. Victor Tremps asks, jumps, bending knee, and hips like you show has correlated to jumping height in counter movement slash jump. Jumps, bending, jumps, bending knee, and hips like you show has correlations... I don't know, Victor, I don't know what you're trying to get at there. Um, Jumps are good. Bend your knee when you jump. Don't bend your knee when you jump. I don't know what you're trying to ask. Maybe I'm being dumb. Jumps, bending knee and hips like you show has correlations to jumping height in dunk. (coughs) Again, I I don't know. Maybe maybe you're talking about the, 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 the jumps over a hurdle or like you're bending the knee to get over the hurdle. Um, That's what you're asking. Uh, Just jump man, don't worry about your knee bend. Don't worry about any of that, especially if you can't dunk yet and that's what you're trying to do. Find a variety of things to jump for, right? So go jump to a basketball rim to where it's not gonna be a huge knee bending thing and then jump over a hurdle. Um, Just use a constraint that gets you to jump higher over and over and over again, right? If you wanna jump high, you have to jump high for a long period of time. To jump high for a long period of time, you have to be interested in jumping high for a long period of time. For some basketball players and for dunking, uh, many times that's just the rim. Like it can literally just be the rim. They're just so interested in dunking that they'll just do a jump, bunch of high jumps, jumping towards the rim over and over every single day, getting a lot of high quality intent jumps. For a lot of athletes, they're not super interested in dunking or they're just not super close to where it like gives them any motivation. Um, so maybe we need adjustable rim, or but that's where the hurdle can come into play. You can get the hurdle, you can move up the hurdle, you can do a bunch of different variety of things. I really like parkour aspects here too because it keeps jumping interested. But you need a high quality of jumps at a high intensity with a high level of focus and I think that's where the variety of jumps comes into play so I don't really focus too much on the amount of straight leg jumps versus the amount of bent knee jumps if that's what you're asking I focus on making sure we have a vertical jump movement problem at our gym and a horizontal jump movement problem at our gym every day that we're jumping um, and making sure that stimulus changes and continuing to progress once you're working with high level jumpers like the, the one percenters of the one percenters, then we need to start focusing on specific aspects of that jumping. Like what are the amount of straight leg jumps? What are the amount of bent knee jumps? What's the difference between their hurdle jump versus like a straight vertical where they're not bending their knees? Where are they weak? So I'm a much better hurdle jumper than a straight jumper because you can bend your knees and I'm a squatty person and I can bring my knees up and have good, um, have good hip mobility to be able to get in those positions to get over a hurdle and you don't get away with as much with uh, when you're going over to dunk, dunk, right? So um, there can definitely be small things you tweak with with the one percenters, but I think a lot of times you just need to focus on jumping at a high intensity and I think the variety of jumps allows you to do that beautifully. Killer K. Colin asked, I've ran into multiple situations lately where longevity is brought up, dot, 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 continued and then didn't continue. So if I find the second part of your question killer, I will ask it, I'll answer it, but I don't really know what you're trying to get to there. Um, Stephen Filler Baral asks, thoughts on efficiency 
on efficiently rehabbing soft tissue injuries and bulletproofing the quads. Um, I don't really believe bulletproofing is true. I think I really like Alec Blennis's kind of approach and what we've been talking about for a while, like turn yourself into a weapon. Don't try to avoid things. Just turn yourself into somebody that's fully capable to run through a wall. Um, and if bad things happen, bad things happen, you adjust on the back end, but don't try on the front end to prevent things. I think a lot of times that turns your program into an injury prevention slob fest that isn't getting a ton of stimulus done, right? We're spending 12 weeks trying to perfect our shin raises rather than just jumping, sprinting, running, and doing things like that. If you're trying to get bulletproof quads, you're trying to get really strong quads, dude, squat, Bulgarians, lunges, zerchers, get really fucking strong, right? Do a lot of deceleration work. Do a lot of jumping, man. It's, it's going to be a lot of quad work there. So if you want quads that are bulletproof, you want quads that are weaponized, go build up big motherfucking quads by squatting, jumping, lunging, and doing all the things athletically that you would do. Don't focus too much on it. If you are a very, like, it's just like maybe you're coming back from an injury and you just don't have any quad development at all, hypertrophy your quads. Like, like, put an active focus in your program to hypertrophy the quads. So uh, something that I do with my chest, you can do the same thing with the quads, like a legging muscle we talk about is on your off days. So we'll have an upper body day, add in some leg extensions on the upper body day, then do your traditional lower body day. Just t treat your traditional lower body day like it would, like traditional lower body day, you're jumping, squatting, lifting heavy. And then on your upper body day, the next day, we're gonna add in even more quads, right? So for me, it would be my chest. So on an upper body day, we're just ripping a normal day. On my lower body day, I'm doing my full lower body day, and then I'm hitting like a couple sets of chest flies, right? Till failure, getting a little, good little pump in. Then we're hitting upper body day again. Then lower body day, we're gonna hit a different machine for the chest flies um, or for the chest and be able to get those chesticles growing, right? Same thing with the quads. You can add in isos almost every single day. You add in leg extensions every single day. You can add in some sort of machine. I like the machines because I feel like the wear and tear on them, like I want to squat two days in a row. That's not saying you can't. Um, I just think for longevity reasons, um, longevity in the sense of like you're going to actually follow this program forever. I think just adding in simple extra sets of machines for the uh, for this machines and a lot of times it makes it fun for the athletes because the athletes are so stuck in like an athletic training program that they haven't done any bodybuilding they haven't hopped on any of the machines in a while and it keeps it fun so for some of the legging muscles i would do like a leg extension on your upper body day at, at two sets of 25 let's say just get a really good pump in and then next time let's go um three sets of 15 on the leg press, right? So we're just trying to get beefy quads, but stimulating the quads. I think frequency is a really, really nice component for hypertrophy that not a lot of athletes touch on. They kind of crush themselves in main sessions, which is great, and it's what we do, and long term will lead to results, but if it's really coming back from an injury or it's really a legging muscle, you feel like you can't grow after a lot of focus, up the frequency, and a lot of times the recovery isn't as bad as just crushing it um, twice a day, so, or uh, twice a week. Steven also asked thoughts on two extremes of 90 degree stability and pro end ranges mobility training. 90 degree stability and pro end ranges mobility. I admit, I think that's kind of like a Seedman type question. Again, train through full ranges of motion. If you want to overload for certain, like the, the shorter range of motion, the more you can overload. So if you're trying to get a high overload stimulus, you can overload in shorter range of motions. That's the only time I'm going to really shorten the range of motion um, is if I'm trying to get a high stimulus there. But otherwise, you're going to find yourself in full range, deep range of motion in life and in sport. You should train it um, actively throughout your program. And um, with, the, with the mobility training, I think a lot of the weighted stretching and weighted lifts that we do uh, are very similar and you can hit like an iso iso weighted lunge for a lot of people is a great mobility tool for their hips because they i mean they're just not able to get in that long, long lunge position and you can weight that and hold it under a ton of uh time under tension there so uh just train through full ranges of motion don't cut out full ranges of motion if you want to overload and do certain ports um where you're going really heavy you can do like a pin squat or a uh like a um, board press, things like that, where you're overloading certain parts. But for the rest of your program, just train through, train through full range of motion. You're going to find yourself there throughout your training program, and it's going to, going to make a world of difference in how you feel and move. Bella asked, what are the baseline movements you use for first-time clients? Uh, I, don't. I don't. I don't have a baseline assessment. I don't have a baseline movement profile. I just have the athletes come in, and what I'm looking for is... How do they move and interact in the games that we play, in the warm-up series that we do, and how do they move and perform in our training session that day? So like an athlete day one will come into our gym, they will run the session that we have that day. We don't do anything special, I don't meet them before, and maybe sometimes we'll text back and forth. Obviously this is different if there's like specific injuries that we need to work on or things we have to pull them out on. 
But I find out so much more. I get so many more data points from just a day of them training. It's like, oh, they can't move their spine at all. Or, oh, they're not confident with the ball in their hand. Or they're super fast, but they're not super agile. I'm just picking up on these points, watching it. And then I'll challenge these points through movement challenges throughout the week. So like I realize they're not good in a 1v1 type setting. I'm going to put them in a lot of 1v1 type settings in my, um, in my training and get data points until we increase that portion. I realize their spine can't bend. We have a gymnastic Wednesdays where we're rolling on the mats. Um, a lot of times you'll see how an athlete segments their spine with this stuff. And I realize really quickly they have an inability to segment their spine. They have an inability to round into flexion or come into extension in some of these positions. And we'll build that up through our program. But it's kind of a long-term like solution to these problems. I see the issue, but we're not gonna just like stop everything we're doing to focus on the one specific issue because I believe as you improve the body holistically, these issues really start to sort themselves out. And the more you get into weeds of one specific issue, a lot of times we're not right there. Like a lot of times I've seen, and I've done this myself too with my own issues, it's like you see an athlete and it's like, oh, they have tight hips in this setting and that's why they can't bend. And you realize you were totally off. Like the athlete's hips, when you bring them into some of these positions, that, that's not the issue. It's just they aren't confident in a pass rush move and that's why they can't seem to bend. Or their spine can't segment and it wasn't a hip issue, it was a spine issue, right? So I think using the data points from the sport and getting a ton of data points rather than focus specifically on like five movement things that might not tell you anything about the athlete and how they move in space or how they move in training in, in real life, which is what actually matters. These tests, I think a lot of times can get you stuck in the weeds. That's not to say the tests are total trash. I just think the human mind, once we have a test, once we have assessments in front of us, we get lost in those assessments and we get lost in playing the game of trying to improve the assessment specifically rather than realizing what that assessment is there for. The assessment is there so that the athlete can move better on the field or the athlete can move better in life, right? That's the reason for the assessment. The OG reason, right, is to get the athlete better. If we can get the athlete better without focusing on the assessment, let's just do that, right? Let's not get lost in the assessment. I've seen so many programs where they focus on these five assessment points that they don't get the athlete better. Like, it doesn't matter, but again, we gamify things on our brain. We get so, like, as coaches, we want an ego hit. We want to show improvement, and that's great. We, we do want to improve our athletes, but are we improving them where it matters, or are we improving them in these arbitrary assessments that we're doing? And uh, is that actually helping them? I don't know. We don't know. We don't know the actual issue. So I keep my assessments very broad, and I just look at how the athlete's trying to move holistically and look at specific struggles. Again, if the specific struggle is a hip thing, then we'll, we'll, we'll do a lot of hip stuff. But again, I think we can find that out organically through movement rather than focusing specifically on random things that we try to force all of our athletes into. Zach Cardi, no fit, asks, do you prefer upper, lower splits over full body for athletes? Why, why not? I don't think it really matters. We do upper lower splits for athletes, but we're kind of hitting lower body every day and trying kind of hitting upper body every day. We just call it upper lower splits. Um, it's kind of like the emphasis for the day. It's like an upper body emphasis, but we're doing some hip mobility. We're doing some sprinting. We're doing some jumping on that upper body day. Uh, Tuesday, we'll do a lower body emphasis and we'll do some upper body work that day. We'll do an upper body ISO. We'll do some shoulder mobility that day. So I don't think it really matters how you split it up. I like having my buckets to hit on each day just to simplify it for my brain so I'm not throwing so much at the athletes at all moments. And I think a lot of times if you just do straight up full body days without buckets, without philosophies, without things that you're trying to hit stimulus wise, some coaches can kind of get lost in what's happening. But uh, however you want to train that athlete, however you personally feel is best, as long as you're getting those buckets hit, it doesn't matter how you do it. With that being said, when it gets to in season, for a lot of these athletes, the, the training days go down. So instead of training with them four or five days a week, we're training with them two days a week. When we train with them two days a week, we're kind of stuck with this kind of full body setting because we only get them for two days a week and we're not gonna hit legs one day a week. But again, our upper lower splits that we have are kind of already like that. We're already hitting lower body on these upper body days and it's kind of organically a full body day, four days a week. We also don't really do a high low model. Um, we're kind of sprinting every day, jumping every day, lifting heavy every day, but balancing it out and being smart about how we do that. It's just, I don't think it needs to be, I don't think there needs to be a big emphasis on upper versus lower or full body or not. I think it needs to be an emphasis on what does that athlete need in front of you and how can you build that out? What would you say to someone who overuses bodily injuries in season? 
I think Luke, you're trying to ask like what happens with an overuse, like what hap what would you do with an injury that is caused by overuse during in season, just because you're required to do a lot of things in season. The answer is survive. Like uh, you get that athlete to survive in season. Uh, Jake was talking about this on um, the Coach Em Up podcast with Tim Riley, but it's like a lot of jumper knee is caused from obsession. And obsession leads to you jumping really high, but it also, and it's the only way that you get the jump really high. It's the only way you get the sprint really fast. It's the only way that I can hit softballs really far is by being obsessed. You don't want to get rid of that obsession and you're not going to get rid of that obsession. These injuries are going to happen. These overuse injuries are going to happen. Obviously the long-term athletic development thing is a different argument, but if you want to get really good at something, you're going to have to do it over and over and over again. I've taken a hundred softball swings every single day for nearly a year right now. And my elbow and back some days feels like it's going to actually explode, right? Um, but I'm obsessed with the sport. And my goal of my program is to survive the thing that I'm obsessed with, to make sure I can survive the thing that I'm obsessed with. So you have to find a program, you have to find a way to have that athlete survive. You're not trying to avoid those things, right? You're not going to be able to avoid those things, especially if you're in season. I'm not just going to be able to stop swinging a bat so I can feel great and my elbow can feel amazing again. That's not my goal, dude. I don't care. The, I don't fucking care about my elbow. I care about hitting a ball 500 feet. I care about winning softball tournaments. The same thing with, the, with these basketball athletes. The, the goal isn't for the knees to feel good, right? Just to feel good. Because if they wanted to feel good, they would just quit basketball, right? The goal is for the knees to feel good so they can jump really, really high, right? So that's a little bit of a different philosophy that I think a lot of PTs get jacked up, a lot of ATs get jacked up on. It's like, well, just take a break. Just take two weeks off. It's like, do I've, I've, I've seen ATs tell athletes in season, in a football season, nevertheless, where it's a six-week, eight-week, 10 week season at max, right? Depending on football or uh, depending on high school versus college versus pros, right? Um, and I've seen athletic trainers say, yeah, just take two weeks off and we'll be back and we'll be ready to go. Bro, what are you talking about? We have a 10, you're gonna, we're gonna take 20% of our season. And I've seen them tell seniors this too, uh, or guys fighting for their roster spot. Yeah, just take two weeks off and you'll be good. What are you talking about, man? That's 20% of their season. They could completely lose their starting spot. You could completely lose your playoff spot. You could lose those two games and it could end your season. It could be the two last games that you play, right? That is not the goal. The goal is not to feel amazing. The goal is to feel good enough to do your obsession, right? And when we're done with the obsession, when we're into the off season, then we can get into feeling amazing and doing all those things and that's really how we pull our athletes back into that but you're not going to fight that obsession and just because you're not obsessed with something and it seems like such a simple fix so we'll just take the two weeks off yeah dude it's not your senior season playing sports right it's not your senior season of uh doing these things right it's not your last football game you have no pressure there you don't understand what you are saying and i think and i just wish AT strength coaches, PTs would just pay attention a little bit more to what they are actually saying when they say these things, right? Um, you have to find a way to survive the season. You have to find a way to survive these injuries. And then in the off season, ideally, we build it up in a way in which we don't have these issues coming back up. Um, but again, a lot of times it's just, it takes a lot of reps. It takes a lot of wear and tear on the body to do really, really cool things. And a lot of times those really, really cool things are worth it. So on to the next one, how to relieve Achilles and calf pain and John 56. Actually, this is going to be a good little journey. And so I don't know how much I'll get into it right now, but I have an Achilles injury in quotations right now. Uh, I was sprinting for a ball in this tournament and my cleat completely, the, the, the fields weren't super great. Uh, and I don't think my cleats were super great. My freaking cleat completely blew up, you know, like the bottom of the cleat completely ripped off when I was sprinting for a ball, completely ripped off. My Achilles kind of went sideways, did not feel good. I didn't pop it, I didn't break it, um, but it's pretty tender. Um, and it's the first time I've had a tender, a tender Achilles. So we're gonna rehab that and we're gonna fix it. Um, but it's gonna be a lot of ISOs. It's gonna be a lot of cut back on jumping and very um, high plyometric volume just for a little bit. and. Um, um, making sure, again, we're surviving the season of softball and getting new cleats. Cleats is the new one, the biggest one. I think this is why the injury prevention thing is kind of crazy. It's like I could have done everything for my Achilles and the cleat just completely blew out. Like, uh, I mean, I'm not saying I was taking perfect care of my Achilles just because I've never had an Achilles issue before. But yeah, we have a super tender Achilles right now. We're going to get new cleats. We're going to do some rehab for it. And we're just going to cut high plyometric volume there. If you're really looking into tendons and getting into the Achilles and the, the jumper's knee, I'd recommend Jake Tura's jumper's knee book and his uh, tendons ligament book. I thought, I don't know if he actually released a new one or if he's still working on that. I should know this. Sorry, Jake, if I, if I butchered this, but go buy his products. He's the tendon ligament expert for all of these things. Mr. Kofel asks, tips for training postpartum. 
I'm not having a baby. I'm not interested in having a baby myself. Um, I don't have anybody that I'm having a baby with, hopefully, anytime soon. Uh, so I'm not going to answer that question. I don't feel qualified to answer that question. Once I have a wife or a kid, maybe I get more interested in that topic. But there's probably a lot better people than me to come to for that question. Um, Buffington asks, as a coach, what are strategies to exclude... Ex what are Wow, I got to read here. What are strategies to exude confidence so you get athletes buying in? I, I've asked, answered this question a bunch, but make sure you're somebody worth buying into if you want your athletes to buy into it. You can... I hate the whole, athletes don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Bullshit, bro. Athletes care about getting fucking results and they care about training for somebody they believe in. That's what they care about. They don't give a fuck if you... I, I have bought into coaches that did not give a fuck about me because I knew they would make me win. I knew they would make me a better athlete. And we both knew that if I went down with an injury, they would replace me in a second. And you know what? I still bought into what they were saying, even though I knew I was a totally expendable piece of their puzzle because I knew they were worth somebody worth buying into because I knew they would get me results, right? So it is not how much the athletes care about how much you can. No, they don't, bro. They, they, they care about winning. They care about getting results. Um, and they care about buying into somebody worth buying into, right? And they, they, they care about that. And maybe that is becoming a caring person. That, that's a big, I'm not saying don't care about your athletes. I'm not saying that. I just think a lot of coaches will be like, well, if I just talk to all my athletes, I'll care. I know a lot of coaches that they're the nicest coaches in the world and athletes don't buy into them worth a shit because they're not somebody worth buying into. They say hi to them. They're an amazing person. It's a good relationship on that aspect. But that athlete knows at the end of the day, that's not somebody that I want to model my life after. It's not somebody I want to model my athletic career after. They don't give a fuck about that. They care about winning. They care about performance. They care about getting results. And, and regardless of results in the field, they care about, is this somebody that's going to make my life better? Is this somebody that I want to model my life after? Get those things in place. Be some, become somebody worth buying into. Don't become somebody worth caring about, right? And again, that's not to say throw out caring for your athletes, but I, I just, I know myself, I've had caring coaches that were amazing people that I never once bought into their program or the things that they were saying because I didn't want to model my life after them. They were almost too soft. They were too kind in quotations. You got to be somebody that exudes a life worth buying into, that exudes confidence, that exudes things that they want to go do, whether that's in sport, whether that's in life. So go be a winner in life and you'll have winners follow you. Uh, Prod Tenzer asked, training alone sucks. Yeah, sure does, man. That's not really a question, but training alone does suck. I believe... A huge part of movement is the movement community that you're a part of. Uh, that's why I really try to build that up in our online community. How can I make this more of a community aspect? It's something I'm desperately interested in with the online space um, because I see the biggest specialty that our gym has in person is our community and the group of weirdos and a group of people just screaming at you while you lift. I think it is the number one thing, the number one training stimulus you can have is a group of savages that are with you. And I think a lot of times the athletes that train alone, for the most part, train alone because they don't want to be pushed to their absolute brink. They don't want to be called out for their bullshit, right? So I think trying to find at least one training partner that is just an absolute savage that will eat you alive on days that you need to be ate alive on because you're being soft, I think that is the number one stimulus that you can have. It doesn't matter about your program. I think people can run a knees over toes Seedman program with a savage training partner and get crazy results. Um, and you can run the greatest program in the world without somebody pushing you and it's just you and yourself and your own thoughts and your own softness there and you cannot get great results there, right? So I do believe training alone sucks. Um, it doesn't mean you can't train alone ever. I just think if you're really pushing for performance, having a training partner there matters deeply. Flash asks, why won't Welty do his bicep curls? Bro, Welty, Welty just, I don't know if he's interested in arms for moms because he's already wifed up. Like he doesn't need bigger arms. He already has that ring on his finger. He's he's done the catfishing already. He's already got his, he's already got his, um, his, his gold dig, he's already gold digging. Like he's already, he's set for life, man. Weldy is set. He doesn't need to do any more arms. He doesn't need to do any more lunges. He's just here for a good time. He's a married man. And um, you can't fault the man. That dude's smart. He played his business cards right and uh, made great business decisions. And now is set up to where he never has to do biceps again. And all the power to him. Eric asks, is the podcast no longer on Apple? I think I'm going to stick with just straight YouTube for a little bit of the time here with the podcast. Um, I really don't like the non-interactive aspect to putting the podcast out to Spotify and Apple. Um, 
there's no comments. There's like, sometimes you get DMs, but you just see the downloads and you have no idea if it was a good episode. I mean, download wise, you know if it's a good episode or not. Um, but again, a lot of times that just has to do with the guest or the, the title that I put on it. Um, but I think the YouTube aspect where people can comment and there's a little bit of an engaging piece, that I, I enjoy that. So I, I, I've struggled with the podcast of putting it out there and it just feels like it's dead. It feels like there's nothing there. And again, I get a lot of DMs about it, but it just doesn't seem very live. doesn't seem like you can communicate with your community. So I'm going to try and stick with just YouTube for a little bit. We'll see how it works. I'm not saying it's going to be a long-term solution. I don't know anybody that just puts it on YouTube. So I get business-wise, it's probably not the best decision. I get some people are going to be frustrated with that. But I just want a little bit more aliveness right now in the podcast and maybe long-term we'll switch back over. Um, but right now, I think I'm going to upload it just to YouTube and um, hopefully get more community engagement there and um, grow it. The, the, the conversations that way and, and um, see what people like, see what guests people want and uh, see what people disliked about the podcast. Naya asked, does cramping have anything to do with local muscle endurance? Any solutions? So if you're cramping uh, a lot in games, I would focus on obviously your hydration levels and mostly, mostly it's going to be some of your electrolytes. So making sure we have like salts in our water, uh, the, the meathead, I think I had a YouTube video on meathead lemonade where you squeeze a lemon and you put some salt in there with the water, mix it up. Um, and just finding, if, if you don't want to do that, making sure your magnesium levels are good. Um, I would mega dose magnesium before you go to bed. I would have that meathead lemonade throughout the day or find a good electrolyte drink throughout the day. Um, lots of fruits are going to be nice for you before game, um, mid game as well, just to help with it. And uh, some of it does come down to just your endurance levels too. Uh, if you're not used to that, it's a massive spike in volume, uh, massive spike in stress that you're not used to. You're going to cramp up. I remember in high school when you're playing both sides. I never really cramped really hard in college football because we're only playing one side of the ball. And some special teams in high school when we were playing both sides of the ball and all special teams, I cramped all the time, man. So um, taking care of your hydration, taking care of your electrolytes, consuming a little bit more fruit, and then uh, making sure there's not massive spikes in volume. But again, sometimes you're not going to be able to avoid that. If you're playing high school football and you just got a lot of volume, you're playing both sides of the ball and all special teams, you're not going to have a really good choice there. So the thing that you can control is making sure you get magnesium before bed and throughout the day, making sure you have fruit, making sure your hydration levels are good and try that meathead lemonade out. Let me know what you think on that. Isaac asked, uni athlete working construction during summer approaches to training. Um, train, man, don't worry about your construction. Don't worry about that. My, uh, for most of my life, I was from five years old, I was pulled out of preschool. It's not a sob story, but from five to 22 is probably the last year I really worked full-time construction and, um, hydration. My dad owns a hydration company, like irrigation company to where we put in underground sprinklers. I don't know if that's everywhere, but in Minnesota, we put an underground sprinkler. So it waters your yard, um, but you dig holes all summer long. So I would train in the morning before I worked with my dad. So from six to eight, I would train. I would work with my dad from eight to like five. And then from five to seven, we go do skelly or football practice right away after or some skill work or some sprinting after, right? So I was training from basically, or we're working out, doing some sort of physical activity from six in the morning to 8 PM every single day, right? Um, and I didn't think anything of it. I never thought it was a bad thing. And, and I, this is where I think information is a bad thing for a lot of coaches and a lot of athletes. It's like, oh my God, it, it would be too much. And as soon as I started to think it was too much, and as soon as I started to cut stuff from my program, I just became a lesser athlete. So don't focus about that. Don't focus on that. Train, work, repeat. Eat food, sleep enough to recover from that, and do it again, right? Um, I think the, the overtraining aspect is a little bit over talked about. And I think most athletes are nowhere near that. Um, I think you can work just fine and you can train just fine. And I think there's a lot of sob stories out there of, I have so many athletes, well, I worked a whole, I worked a whole day, dude. It's like, yeah, dude, I, I've, I've done it for my whole life. I understand it sucks. I understand it's not ideal, but it doesn't mean you're not able to do it, right? You're, you're totally able to, you're totally functioning, functioning and able to do that. Don't try to cut that stuff from your program. As soon as you try to avoid a, uh, an overworking aspect. As soon as you try to avoid that aspect, you under train and you undershoot and you become just a lesser athlete, right? So find a spot to train, focus on your training. Don't train your training program. Don't change your training program and just work, man. It's just part of life where you're at right now. Um, ideally you get out of that when you make a lot of money or you become a professional athlete and then you fully get out of it. But in the time being, it's what you got to do. Go do it. Mark Dettel asked, which sapien are you most concerned for becoming soft once they leave JST? 
Oh, uh, man, I think uh, Frankie. I think Frankie's going to get pretty soft on us once he leaves JST. I think uh, we're keeping him afloat right now. He skipped this morning, so he's on my head right now. Skipped this morning, and he came up with an excuse for why he skipped. And I think if we're not there to push him, there's a high probability he becomes pretty soft when we leave, and that would be a shame, Frankie. So don't prove me right there. Uh, make sure you're training when you leave JST. We got a, our group of OG Sapiens leaving this Actually, in two days. In two days, they're leaving. They're graduating. We're going to have a new wave of athletes coming in. But we've been training these athletes for three years now straight every single morning. I'm going to miss them dearly. Um, but I think a lot of them are going to get soft when we leave, Daddle. And uh, I don't know if there's anything we can do about that until they reach out and said, dude, I got soft. I need to come back to JST. It comes back to the community aspect. You need a community to push you. And um, we're that community for you, Frankie. So if you're ever struggling, we'll be there. Come up from Wisconsin. We're there for you. Final question. When can we union, union, bro, read. When can we unionize to conquer the ATG cult? Uh, well, I think we took our first step to doing that uh, when we got Ben Patrick spam messaging us on uh, Instagram and commenting on everything that we were doing. Um, I think, again, I, I've talked about this in a lot of videos and maybe we cover this. I think there's a lot of virtue signaling going on. I think he's saying a lot of stuff where it's like, well, people took my ideas and they, they take them out of proportion. And then I go look at the people that he's saying that about and he's commenting all that stuff saying, oh my God, great video. Like I saw a video about the bench press where he's like, this dude was talking about like tip raises being the number three most important thing to get your bench press up. I've seen, um, yeah, just a bunch of videos like that with, and then Ben will pat, Ben Patrick will comment on that said video and will be like, great video, amazing video. It's like, Dude, Ben Patrick, you are Batman. You're telling all of your Robins, great job when they're posting this stuff. Then you don't get to say, well, I never told them to say that. Or I wasn't the one saying that, right? You know what you're doing as Batman. You know what you're doing as the leader of the cult. Um, I, I just don't think you get to have your cake and eat it too. I don't think you get both ways where you get to say, well, it's not me saying it. It's them saying it. Yeah, but who taught them that? Who are they copying? Who do they want to be like, right? So I think we got to take some ownership there, right? Um, I'm setting up a little bit of a, hopefully a podcast or a debate with him where we can kind of talk about some of these things. But again, I think he is very charismatic. I think he's very good at protecting his cult and protecting his image. And I think that's the only way you get to be, have 2.3 million followers. But I think there's a lot of bullshit there. I think there's a lot of crap behind the scenes um, that is not talked about that uh, people don't see. And I think Somebody needs to stand up to the bullshit. I think people need to stop falling for the crap that he has. And it's hard, man. He messaged me a bunch of stuff, and I started to feel like, I was like, oh, man, am I, maybe I'm in the wrong here. And again, I think this is a big piece of it. I don't like being mean. I don't. I, I, it's, I'm very, uh, this is going to sound like an ego stroke, but I'm very introspective. I, I think about a lot of these things. I think about negative comments on Instagram a lot. Um, I troll people on Instagram, but that's just the, more of a front just to troll to have fun trolling. But I'm very introspective with a lot of this stuff. I think about, am I being too mean? Am I being too harsh? And then I get messages of, from people thanking me because he stole their product or that they got terrible results and then he said they got terrible results on the program and then they got blocked by Ben Patrick or just, just a, lot of, a lot of garbage there that nobody stands up for. I see a lot of strong coaches that I respect. I respect them as strong coaches, but Ben Patrick sided with them or collabed on one of their videos or said they were doing a great job. So then that coach, instead of saying anything, calling out the bullshit, I, I know a lot of really smart coaches that know tib raises don't do fucking shit. They do not cure any of this. And they will stand up for Ben Patrick when he does this because Ben Patrick has collabed on one of their videos and they want that 2.3 million followers. They're making business decisions. I get it. But I think long term, it takes a lot of strength and, and it needs to be said. Some of these things need to be said. Some of the times you need to stand up for what you actually believe in, not what the best business decision is. And I think long term that leads to better business decisions. Naval talks about doing playing long-term games with long-term people and not getting stuck in this scammy kind of like short-term business game of like right now, my business move, the best business move for me is hop on this podcast, but Ben Patrick collab on him with a bunch of stuff, change my mind and tell him, Oh yeah, he's, he's the bee's knees for everything. I was totally wrong. That's the best business move. I will make a lot more money. I will be exposed to a lot more people doing that. I just, there's something in my heart and something from the stories that people tell me that is telling me that is wrong, that there is bullshit there that somebody needs to stand up to it and that it's not as rose colored as people are making it seem. And uh, I'm all right with standing up to that. Um, uh, I have a, I feel like I have a deep responsibility. I, J Jordan Peterson talks about 
when you see a problem, it is your problem to fix. If you don't fix it, nobody will. Um, and I see a problem there. I see a problem with some of the Mike Boyle stuff. I see a problem with a lot of these things, and I feel like it's worth calling out. And uh, I hope people call me out on my bullshit as well. And uh, we can argue again. It's not. I don't wish any harm on anybody's family or business or anything like that. I just think when we're making extreme claims and we're making a lot of money and when we're preying on injured athletes or potentially injured athletes and we're making athletes more neurotic and we're making athletes more scared of movements and we feel like we need to make these athletes do special training, um, I think somebody needs to stand up and say that's bullshit. Um, regardless of the business implications and that it's not okay to do that. And hopefully that's what we're doing. So um, that's all the questions we're going to cover today on this Q&A. 40 minutes, that's pretty good. We got through a lot of questions in 40 minutes. Um, we're going to go lift now and then go hit some softballs. So appreciate you guys watching. Appreciate you guys sticking with me. Keep chopping wood.